Right. Thank you very much for that introduction. I hope uh, I can be heard by those and you can see the screen. Um, just to, I'm going to talk a bit about what the Scottish Castle Association do. Uh, those who haven't come across us, I think you, you know one or two of our members in the past. Uh, and then the sort of work that I'm kind of continuing with on that behalf. Um, this is our sort of the background where, where we were actually celebrating our 25th uh, anniversary last year, put on hold by all the lockdown. Um, and in 1996, a small group of castle enthusiasts decided to get together and form the SCA. Uh, some of those are still involved, like John Buchanan Smith, who restored New Mills, and he still is editor of our journal. Uh, um, Ian McKeever is still very active. When I visited him the other day at Strathendry, he's now building a folly in his wall garden. David Steele is still very involved, although he's handed Akewood on to his um, son. Um, and of course, I've, Nigel Tranter was very important in the early years of the Scottish Castles Association. And the image I've got up on that screen is Barra Castle that he drew. Um, and I always puzzled by it because it doesn't have the garden wall, but that's of course so he can show the courtyard at the front. The Barra Castle is where my family lived for, for many years, my, my effectively about 250 years. Uh, the, the Ramses and then married into the Irvins and my mother was an Irvin. Uh, so that was my sort of involvement with Scottish castles. Um, the Nigel Tranter Memorial Award is one of the pre one, one of the prizes we have and we've just given it to a castle in Roxburghshire um, and um, there's been many awards over the years often to for the restoration of places. Uh, Fenton Tower, which is in East Lothian, was awarded it in 2002. Okay, now um, we have a kind of a mission statement uh, and in a way um, this idea of preserving the past for the future. Some of it sounds a bit pompous, uh, but you know, encouraging responsible ownership. But I'm just picking out a couple of things. Creating a permanent up-to-date record, that's something that uh, they were very keen that I continue doing. That's what my brother, in a way, had started work on. Uh, and that's rather fun because it's an excuse to travel around the whole of Scotland. Another one is to promote study at all levels of education, historians, architect, architects. And I've, I've been uh, keen to encourage that, having had a background in education uh, for, for my career. So it's good to get recruit youngsters particularly uh, to be involved either by writing articles for us uh, or providing them with some support, like, uh, you know, helping them with their doing studies. Um, and, and then there's uh, liaising with other interested bodies is something we try and do quite a bit. Uh, and, and obviously there's an overlap with the AHSS or, and the National Trust and the Historic Scotland HES as it is now. And we organised regular meetings. And, and then, of course, we've got uh, the, the images I've got there is Hart Hill, which is just down below my cottage in Aberdeenshire. Um, and it, it's, it's a um, castle that was restored in the 90s. Uh, very, I remember climbing to the top of it, uh, but the spiral staircase, it had been burnt by the lad um, when he was being pursued for debt. And so actually it's a relatively straightforward restoration. Uh, Knock Hall is another one that's very topical at the moment that I believe the owner wants to sell it. And I believe that I've got one or two people approached wanting to, to, to buy it, but can we get these people linked up? Um, Tarbot is one that's uh, one of, they've joined our association. Uh, so I visited it when I was over there last year. Very impressed with the way they've set it up and talking about education is really good display boards there uh, and it's it's a it's a you know it was a really interesting visit so it's nice to encourage these local groups um who, who've taken the initiative to preserve a bit of the local history and um 
new pinky uh, house, the painted ceiling. We've got that thing about um, encouraging uh, relevant our current um, members carved. He, he has done painted ceilings. There's a couple of our members who have uh, done painted ceilings in, in restorations. And he carved the uh, staff, which is shown at the bottom there, recently as a presentation to our retiring treasurer. And that's a, a one of model of one of his favorite castles in, in Aberdeen, Wallace Town. But uh, beautifully made, a real craftsman. And it's lovely to encourage craftsmen and put people in touch with craftsmen. Um, this is the restoration of, um, you know, Scottish castles. This is uh, Kirkup, which is in uh, near Selkirk, and you can see here it's actually got uh, a roof on now. And it the first chapter of story uh, was, I think, a bit short of money, and sadly he died. But uh, someone who actually knew the family has recently taken it on, and I visited it this year, and it's really coming on very well as a restoration project um, and he hopes to have it available to to rent out to people who, who are going to be up in the area um, for shooting or whatever and one of the big problems of restoration is to find a real purpose behind each of the buildings that you restore this is another fascinating project uh, fairly this is being restored in Ayrshire overlooking Little Cumbrae on the hilltop and um, one of our members has really done a great job. It's taken him a long time to get permission, but he really is uh, approaching it. He's got a lot of expertise in the building trade. And they took me right up to the top uh, on the scaffolding when I was there, which is great because when he posts a, an image of what he's doing, he puts a little clip on our WhatsApp uh, every now and then of two minutes so just showing what's going on and he's got to the top of the wall head and he's now getting ready in in late in the spring to start putting the roof on uh, and that's a really exciting project and then this is another one i saw recently Kilochen, which is uh, in ayrshire as well uh, it's just recently been bought by new owners and when i visited we were both exploring it they they, they they bought it on steam, just come over from America. So we're still exploring it uh, when I was visiting. And in fact, it raised a whole lot of issues about what, was it a murder hole above the, above the front door? And they didn't know anything about that big uh, kind of um, splayed window in the main hall, which you can see in that gable uh, down there. So that, that was a, a fun visit uh, because Although they've got no furniture in the, the castle, they hope to find suitable furniture so that they can, um, again, rent it out when they're not over visiting it themselves. But it was good. We climbed right to the top from the attics in the bottom right to the top. And it's nice to see these properties still with a, a life. Uh, we've done lots of Scotty uh, tours. Um, we've done 77 tours, visited. 735 sites, that's an article that's just been written for our latest journal. Um, and we do about two tours normally. And of course, we're not in normal times at the moment in Scotland. And then um, we do one international tour. It might be Wales, it might be England, it might be France, it might be Spain, it might be Ireland. And so uh, we've still done covered at 557 sites in, in Scotland. In Persia recently, uh, that was our last sort of full tour. Um, we went uh, to Merthyr, which is a fascinating, very old tower, 14th century tower, the base of that. Uh, obviously with later extensions, which, made, which are lived in by the family. And a lot of the castle tours we do, we go to castles that are not normally open to the public. Uh, so that, that was uh, interesting. In fact, there was a new build, Murthy, at the bottom of the garden. Um, 
and it was just about completed, but never really fully finished uh, when they decided to pull it down completely. Uh, so that was a Victorian castle that didn't, didn't survive. Uh, and then we went to Castle Cluggy, which is a ruin rather overgrown as you can see, but there's a group who are trying to kind of tidy it up and make it more accessible and, and put up display boards and things like that. Uh, so that was nice to be visit, visit that. It's actually one of the few uh, rather kind of overgrown sites that we've visited where we were actually hosted in the caravan park nearby afterwards. They gave us tea and cakes, which was a, a really nice welcome. Uh, one of my first tours when I was able to came, I went to East Lothian, I was fascinated by Inuit, if that's the way you pronounce it, uh, because again, it was uh, an absolutely fascinating ruin. It uh, was, of course, besieged in uh, 1547 by the Duke of Somerset. And what I hadn't realized until I went around there and found from some of our, my colleagues, the detailed knowledge of, of Somerset's incursion, because it had been written up. And so a lot was known about it. And I think it's Thornton Castles, the other side of the valley, was blown up and there's nothing to, I believe there's a bit of masonry down in the bottom of the valley when they blew it up. This one was burnt. One man managed to escape, but he ran straight into the forces coming up the, the glen, so he didn't survive. But you look at these fortresses and you find it amazing that so many of them didn't survive very long when they, when they were besieged. And then we went to Bargone, which um, again was fascinating, partially because when they were taking down some of the Victorian part, they discovered a much older uh, origins to the castle. It was sort of considered to be an L plan uh, 17th century, but the alter alterations revealed that it had a much earlier uh, kind of probably 15th century origins. And one of the things that I'm really interested about is finding out as much as I can about the history of the site. Was there a, an even earlier property there? Was it built on a new site or did they use uh, the same site? So if you delve into the cellars under these castles, you, you actually find uh, that they show an even earlier date than the, the owners perhaps thought. We like meeting up and uh, so we've had a couple of um, visits this year. We've actually been able to do a little bit more this year. Uh, in uh, September, we put off our summer picnic till September because of the restrictions. And we had a very successful, with over 50 people turned up. A couple of us arrived in our old vintage cars. And uh, at Lauriston Castle, this is not the one in Edinburgh, this is the one up near Montrose. Um, it's got a fabulous history in itself in that on the left, you can see there's a uh, uh, that's the old tower, which is about 14th century. Carved into it is a, a well, there was a debate whether it's a latrine shoot or a well. We're pretty sure it's a well, probably covered by a wooden cover to it. And then at later stages, they've added another four stories to the original tower. But the council, in their wisdom, thought it was a bit dangerous that the, this area where the modern house stands was a bit derelict. So they bulldozed it into the ravine. So the new owners uh, had to A, um, get out all the rubbish from the ravine so that they could restore the gardens and got Ian Begg, famous architect, to build a, a, a kind of new baronial hall. But a lot of the 13th century curtain wall still survives and not only this marvellous 18th century garden, but also um, there's a vault and a tunnel, uh, which is one of the themes that I've got really quite interested in finding out more about. We decided to have a, another winter dinner. We call it winter dinner rather than Christmas one, because we, we, we kind of reckon people in November can meet up. And uh, we went to Merikuta House, 
which is near Aberdeen, because it's got a fantastic uh, history in its, its own right. Um, that photograph of the gathering of, of members is in the 16th century hall, and that stands on top of a 13th century vaulted cellar, which um, the managing director took me down to see on a previous visit, uh, which came from the days of the Knights Templars. And this, of course, intrigued me about the role of the Knights Templars, and of course, the role of the church, in, in, because the Knights Templars fell out of favour in the 13th century and, and were disbanded, but probably survived in Scotland uh, rather, you know, rather than, than um, on the continent. Uh, and they were obviously very powerful, very wealthy, and uh, very um, militaristic. And there is this theory that in fact it was their presence at Bannockburn that won the day for Robert the Bruce. Uh, rather than the story that it was all the women banging their pots and pans that frightened the English knights into retreat. And you can imagine the Knights Templars would still have been, had access to money and, and military might at that time. And it, it's certainly worth exploring. But that, that area um, is sort of being divided up, that property has been divided up into about four or five different estates. So it shows how powerful they were. Um, then we go on to uh, some of the properties that we uh, members live in. This is Ockletree near Linlithgow. Uh, this is um, my, my predecessor home. A lovely, lovely, fascinating uh, Tahas makes a lovely family home. This is uh, New Mills. Our, the editor of our journal restored this. They'd been looking for somewhere to restore for a long time. It was when it was built in the middle of nowhere, um, and it's now surrounded by the town, but uh, it's just behind the pub. And it, it, at one stage, it was a prison. In Covenanting times, the first floor was a prison. And uh, it was amazing to see the restoration of it. They've really done very little to spoil the original architecture uh, and the, they've obviously taken out the prison cells to make a very nice sitting room uh, on the first floor. And uh, it, it's got all sorts of quirky things like we couldn't quite work out what these different ribs on the, on the front represent, uh, you know, what, what different stages, but they're only on the front um, and along here and here. But the, the other thing is that the front door, which is just behind my car there, is, uh, has got three drawbars and I've never again seen three drawbars. And then the window up here on the first floor has got two drawbars. And again, it's not often that you see drawbars across windows. You, you might get grills, but it was just interesting, different, um, quirky things. This is one old knock. Um, this was a gardener's cottage when the new Victorian house was built reasonably nearby. Um, but the new owner has sort of taken the remains of this old knock castle and turned it and he saved everything that was still standing and then added a, a, a modern bit to, to make it a, a, an attractive uh, kind of holiday let. Uh, and it's lovely that he sort of saved what he has and instead of it being just demolished, he's found a use for it. And in fact, this little turret in the foreground is, would you believe, a sauna. Uh, Piccolo was an interesting castle that I visited by chance when I was in um, Fife. Uh, it wasn't on my list to go to the, on the, the day, and then I saw it on the hill side as I drove past I thought oh I must just pop in and I went and knocked on the door introduced myself and the owner said ah oh, I've just been reading your newsletter do come in and I then got a, a wonderful conducted tour of the whole place and it's taken him about 40 years to restore it um, and it's got painted ceilings and all sorts of quirky bits of furniture but it's an absolutely fascinating uh, building 
And what intrigued me again was in the top, you can't really see it by because of the tree on the left, but there's a lantern tower. And of course, because it overlooks the, the fourth, you wonder whether, you know, what was the significance of that? You know, I, you've got watchtowers, of course, on the top of castles, but what was, how many of them had a lantern tower? So that was again an interesting piece. Uh, this is quite an impressive little um, tower house in that it's brand new. Uh, the owner uh, did try to find a castle to restore. He had a couple in his sights. He approached them, but things fell through at the last minute or just became impossible. So in the end, he decided to build his own tower house with everything that you would find, including a first floor entry, uh, a yet cap house at the top, parapet at the top, uh, painted ceilings, and he's installed everything uh, that you might like enjoy, underfloor heating, uh, and, and really very comfortable. But even he's had a few problems with damp getting in, even though it's a new build. And then, of course, there are some ruins. This is, in fact, uh, my local, it's only a few hundred yards from where I'm talking to you at the moment, Avaki, uh, belongs to one of our members. One, he's been a member for many years uh, and he's got this ruin in, on, on his land. And of course, a lot of, a lot of our members have actually got ruins and hopefully they're going to conserve them and maybe put up an information board about the history of it. The Gordon Laird of um, Avaki was at, um, at Culloden and after Culloden he escaped and he hid in one of the turrets. Well, if you there were little Batisans, one in that corner, one in this corner, tiny, and you look at that tiny building and think, how could you hide from the Hanoverian troops there and not be found if they really wanted to find you? So that's uh, another theme that I would like to find out a bit more about um, the, the castles involved with Culloden. Uh, we do keep in touch with our, our members as best we can, uh, and we produce a journal. It, the first few years it was called the Newsletter, which was mainly a count of trips done, uh, and uh, John Buchanan-Smith did wonderful, um, did wonderful um, sketches of the castles, like Nigel Trent had done and McGibbon and Ross had done before. But uh, now, of course, we've got photographers who, who do a good record. And you can see uh, the one on the left has got uh, Baltasan, uh, the, the, sorry, the um, Barham, uh, which was the um, restored. Uh, and, and you can see the idea of what, what it was like before it was restored. And then the other one is, for me, Slothian Garleton, which is one I've not yet seen, but I hope to as I travel around. Um, we're trying to, we've got a, a, very, a very good um, IT expert, who, someone who, who keep, runs our website. And so we have a, a website which uh, does attract quite a lot of interest. Um, she tends to pass on queries to people, you know, depending on what, what the query is to people who might be able to answer it and you get all sorts of intriguing questions. It might be someone asking for, um, you know, if we, a castle, we've got several people ask, approaching us wanting to know if castles that are coming up for sale or castles that might be available to restore. Um, and it's, it's, that's always a tricky one. We had a TV company wanting to get a uh, seeker site. Um, someone wanting to do a Mary Queen of Scots tour of castles. Um, so we tried to give him an idea. A lot of um, specific castles we get asked about, which is why we're trying to build up a database. For e recently, someone asked about Balfour Castle in Fife, uh, and I discovered that the panelling had been rescued. Some of it is at Dean Castle in Ayrshire, but frustratingly, Dean Castles all boarded up while they, they, they 
a big renovation program is going on. So I'll have to go back later to see that. Um, and we I had a, a schoolgirl doing a project on Scottish castles, so able to provide her with a bibliography that I thought might be available in the local uh, library. I had to be kind of aware of that. Um, because of all the lockdowns and the lack of ability to meet up, I've um, we, we've started sending out a, a, a newsletter every couple of months on things that are topical to keep in touch. Uh, we have to send, a, most of them are their email contacts, but we do have to print out a version for those people who, who don't really do modern communication and like to get, get things in through the post. Um, but it is been, it's been rather fun to do because there's always stories coming up uh, in the press that we can, and so we can keep in touch with people um, about that. Uh, we tried because again of the lockdown, this is our president, Richard Oram, uh, who's at Stirling University, and decided to have um, a, a first uh, winter talk. And as you can see the theme, the dark dank towers. Now this is the image that was McGibbon and Ross and Cruden and a lot of the early um, Douglas Simpson particularly uh, really stressed but uh, Charles McEwen very came up with this idea of the Scottish chateau suggesting that actually these towers were much more comfortable um, for instance at Royal and uh, you could see a bit of the ruin behind the that building and then there's the, the new Royal and Castle up on the hill, which is, I think it kind of, it's got a big um, sport golf course so associated there. Some of the panelling was rescued and just relocated. And his theme was, of course, at places like Craigie Vale, you've got fantastic plaster ceilings, uh, even, you know, even in this early time. Uh, and he was talking about various themes, which led us in the end to uh, the, the whole debate about restoration or not restoration. Teorum is one of the kind of flagship examples where the person had the money, had the plan, but sadly, uh, Historic Scotland at the time were just not prepared to go along with what he wanted to do. So it's just being allowed to kind of rot away uh, when it could be uh, restored, like yeah, I did on a very similar sort of position. Um, and which was very derelict, of course, when they took it on in 1930s. Anyway, Richard gave a really thoughtful talk uh, and showed an extensive knowledge of castles from all over Scotland, uh, well, beyond as well, but, but particularly the ones that we focus on. Um, now, my role, well, since I got involved, that's... Uh, my old family home, but uh, my uncle sadly had to sell it. Uh, and my mother stayed on there till, till uh, she died. And she'd been brought up there before the war, so knew it well. Um, my problem was, of course, I had uh, not only all the contents to find a home for, but my brother's research. And my brother being an archeologist had a couple of rooms at the top full of boxes of research documents. Some of it went to the Perth High Street and some went to Fetanir Dig and that, but the castle stuff, I wasn't quite sure what to do. And at the time, Braemar had just been taken over by the community to restore and someone put me in touch with them. And right at the top, they had an empty room. And I thought, well, I can't store furniture up here, but I had the brainwave of, suggested they might like to host the Scottish Castles project, which they jumped at. Uh, you can see my Riley car in the foreground, which is a great way of going around castles, because if you turn up in a, a vintage car, you tend to get more warmer welcome than if you turn up in a battered old Freelander. Uh, among the other things that I had in my collection, which is fun to, to go through, is the portfolio about Anna Forbes Irvin, who was the wife of the 24th, I think it was, Laird of Drum. And 
Um, in fact, one of her paintings of Braemar Castle done in about 1840, 1850, that sort of period, was used when they were um, planning the rehaling of Braemar. Braemar's now closed for two years while they uh, repaired, they've run the roof, now they're going to repair the harling. And this is a community project, which is actually great news. And they've op reopened it to, to the public. And, and uh, I've been, as I said, I've got a room there with a lot of my brother's research uh, at the top, which I've just got to gradually filter through, um, trying to fill in some of the gaps. Um, now, the sort of research I'm doing is following up my brother's idea with Ian Bryce was to update McGibbon and Ross 100 years on. Um, that covers about 850 castles and a few other domesticated properties, but about 850 castles, many of them sketched. In fact, uh, Anna Forbes Irvin had sketched a, a couple of the ones on the Isle of Isla I discovered to my great joy. Nigel Tranter, uh, in his five volumes of tower houses, fortified tower houses, also sketched many of the 550 castles that he covered. And that's a priority. And I built up a, an extensive library, I think, surrounded about in this conservatory of books by Lethe, Billings, Cruden, McKean, Tabrahan, Stell, Martin Coventry, of course, um, but also lots of articles. I've got cabinets full of files on lots of individual castles. And so far, I've got a database of about 3,200 castles. I've been told there's probably about 6,000 castles in Scotland, so I've got a long way to go. I base it on the old counties, um, and uh, for instance, in Haddingtonshire or Midlothian, uh, East, East Lothian, it's um, about 84 I've got on the list at the moment, and 140 in Midlothian. But of course, if you can point me, and if you can point me to more that I've missed out, I'd be thrilled. Currently, I've only managed to visit 440 castle sites, I'm counting as I go, but um, you know, some of my colleagues who've been members since the early days have probably got many more under their belt than I have, but uh, it's still great fun, particularly finding the ones that are lost. That model is a model of Barra Castle, which I found in one of my brother's files. I haven't found it yet, but, I did find this, a set of castles that were made in uh, 1975 by uh, George Douglas. He, he was a architectural technician. Uh, and in the response to a comment I put in a, one of our newsletters, someone said, oh, I know him well. He doesn't do emails, but if I went to see him, I wrote to him and he spoke on the phone and I went to see him. And he produced these wonderful models that's in his cottage, out of a box. And this one is one of Pilmure. Uh, and it's brilliantly, it's got the, um, the squinch, this is kind of architectural term there, which is actually showed on this model, as well as the heraldic shield there. Uh, and I believe that this is still occupied, I think is it the uh, Pilmure House Trust that still run it? Uh, but it's just a wonderful model. And these models I thought were too good just to sit in boxes. Uh, and so we put them on display at our dinner at Palathi House that year, caused great interest because a lot of the members actually knew had even stayed in some of the houses. And, um, and then I had them on display at Braemar Castle till it closed. And uh, I've talked to George and hopefully we might take them uh, down to the Caledonian Club in London, just to get a link with, with the Caledonian Club, because they're beautiful models and they deserve to be seen. Well, it's, uh, you know, what, what one of the things is castle tunnels. Um, I got intrigued by this when I was teaching at Merkiston, uh, I was dragged out of retirement uh, when someone was ill and they, they, they persuaded me to teach for a term. I ended up there for two terms. But you can imagine my fascination when I realised was the ruined castle in the, in the grounds. Of course, the school moved from Merkison Castle 
in the 1930s to Collington House. Uh, and um, a bit more about that in the end, but, but Collington Castle, uh, one of the stories I discovered was that in fact there was a tunnel here. They know that well, there was one because when they were do, digging around a, a cottage near the school swimming pool, they suddenly came across the tunnel and they described it as being very similar to the one I found at Picapel Castle. Now this story I'd heard of for many years that the Marquis of Montrose when he'd been captured and was being taken to be executed in Edinburgh, um, they stopped at uh, Picapel Castle and he'd been offered by the Chatelaine uh, a chance to escape. She managed to get his guards drunk uh, and then showed him an a, a escape tunnel. Um, but he decided, refused, he'd face the rats of uh, Edinburgh rather than the rats of uh, Pitt Capel. But in fact, the, it turned out that the, uh, I can't show it very easily, but the, it's at, on the second floor of that tower on the right is where the prison was. And it's still there, there's still the, the steel door. And you can see where the, um, steps went down through the wall. They blocked it off now, but the, there was uh, steps going down through the wall. There was a moat in those days, and we found the other end of it about a hundred yards away in the ha-ha. And Christopher Burgess, sons who lived there at the time, he, he said, oh, I, I remember crawling down it 50 years ago with my Labrador, but then my torch ran out of battery, so I had to come out. And so he's determined to find it, determined to show me, and we did find it. And it was very well made tunnel, still intact. I didn't quite have the courage to crawl all the way 100 yards through it, but, but it just has, you know, made me realize that there's a lot more about these tunnels. And since I wrote an article for the journal about them, we keep coming out with more and more tunnels. What exactly their purpose was, possibly for smuggling, possibly as a way of getting, escaping, if you were besieged and getting help from neighbors. Um, it, you know, there's all sorts of debates. We think covenanting times because Craig Castle, there's a lot of Alma Christi, Alma Christi symbols there. It was very much a Catholic, Gordon Catholic castle. It's got a tunnel. We know about that because when it, Craig Castle came up for sale the other day, they mentioned in the sale document that it had a tunnel. Uh, then I got involved in, uh, when I was out in the Hebrides, came across galley castles. I saw this book, Castle and Galleys, edited by Paula Martin. Several of the um, articles written by people I knew, including Richard Oram. Uh, and so I got absolutely fascinated. The one island I haven't got to yet is the Isle of Barra. Although I once got a phone call from the Isle of Barra to Barra Castle on the mainland, never thought I'd say that. <coughs> now this castle has a building outside the, the, the curtain wall for the galley slaves. Sorry, sorry. So the galley slaves were incredibly, um, you know, I suppose they, they quite really quite important. Dunbar Castle, of course, is another one where uh, during the sieges that it suffered, they were able to supply the, the, the being trapped inside uh, like Black Agnes. Uh, so instead of starving to death, they were actually supplied because small boats could get into the castle. And apparently uh, until about the 1990s, that arch across that gap did survive, though it has not since collapsed. But a study of galley castles has really intrigued me. And of course, when you read up about the history of the West Coast, you find that, um, you know, some the Maclean's could raise uh, 180 galleys. Well, if you've got 10, 12, 20 men on a galley, you had a whole army with you. Um, and, and so it really would become quite, quite an Im important feature. And of course, some of the sieges like Aileen Donnan, like St Andrews, were, you know, they were bombarded from the sea. 
Um, and so, you know, it is uh, a, a, another aspect of studying castles. This was one recently I came across, Baltasan. Uh, the chap who owned it and was hoping to restore it, but I think he's, he's kind of run out of energy on that front now, sadly. But he gave me a really fascinating conducted tour. And it's got, he's got amazing knowledge of the interior, all the quirky things about the different rooms, at the different levels. It really would be a, a marvellous ruin to restore. But as I was leaving, I noticed this lintel. Um, in, you can see in the middle there, between the door and the window there, you can see there's a, 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 a supporting arch, but for nothing. And I realised that that was at the back of the main, um, main uh, fireplace in the hall. And I thought of commenting on that. He said, ah, now that is called the Mason's Hole. And I hadn't really thought about the actual logistics of building a castle. Once you've got the ground floor in with the narrow arrow slits, as they call windows, narrow windows, probably with um, grills across them. You've got your yet and your door with draw bars. You can't put the draw bars in after you. You've got to put them in when you're building the wall. That becomes apparent. Um, and then you've got spiral staircases, which were sometimes quite tight. Which, so getting materials up, so you left a gap, uh, which you could then fill in at a later stage, um, at, you know, in, in the main hall, so you could get materials. So now, every time I go around any old castle, particularly when they take the, if there's no harling, I'm looking for clues in the architecture as to how it was built. And of course, you're looking for clues as to the different stages. Uh, local, local properties. Uh, Carberry Tower intrigued me because we went there for lunch one day on one of our trips um, and it was the parapet. I hadn't, it, it, I don't know of many places where there was a working platform for artillery at the top of the tower. Most, you've either, a lot of places like Threve had artillery set on walls, on a curtain wall around the tower. Um, similarly at Dunbar, they had a, a, a kind of artillery tower built, kind of blockhouse built for artillery separate. So this intrigued me and I'd like to find out much more about other places that have got, you know, something quirky like that. I went to a lecture uh, at um, Aberdeen uh, about an architect who'd been uh, responsible for the Crombie Halls at Aberdeen University, which are classic sort of uh, modernist is being the kind word. When I was teaching, we, we talked about brutalist art architecture uh, and Robert Matthew had been responsible for Festival Hall and um, building tower blocks at various universities like Dundee. So I, when I discovered halfway through the lecture that his home was Mar Keith Marshall, I was absolutely fascinated, uh, you know, that he seemed to, you know, that he obviously lived in this sort of property. Um, I have not visited it yet, so I'm longing to, um, but it was recently up for sale. And this was taken from, uh, I noticed the sale uh, in the paper, but I'd be intrigued by it. And that brings me to the end of, with, by looking at Collington Castle. Now, because I was in the, the school for um, two terms, I, I, I had to get into the castle. And a friend of mine who was uh, doing a lot of on the Forbes family, um, sorry about the interstate, he sent me that print with Collington House and said, that's Collington House. Uh, Gibson House now or whatever it's called. I said, no, it's not. It is the castle. I recognise it. That's the water of Leith down below. And then that castle played quite an important uh, role when Cromwell was um, chasing Leslie back to Edinburgh after the Battle of Dunbar. And, and the castle was plundered. Now, Red Hall nearby was completely flattened. It was resisted. Uh, but was eventually taken and, and there's hardly anything left of it. This one 
was clearly plundered. There's evidence afterwards that it was plundered. And um, anyway, the, the 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 other side from the print side, you you there's a, there was the stair tower, which was jutted above the the headmaster's garden, and in his wisdom, he decided to get the ivy taken off. And sure enough, one stormy night, there was a loud crash and the tower landed in his garden. And the school decided to completely fence it off, you know, all the way around. Obviously, didn't want anyone getting injured or... And so they fenced it off. And you can imagine, as a member of the SEA, I was pretty determined to get inside it. And eventually I managed to get the key to the phone, get in, and I took the chaplain with me, um, just in case he was actually interested in the history. So, but I thought, <laughs> I didn't know how dangerous it might be. And they still got these vaulted rooms, these vaulted cellars, vaulted passages. And it really deserves, um, you know, conservation at least. And so uh, when you go up onto the first floor, there's this, you know, various doorways, slightly complicated uh, rebuilding. And I think that's part of the um, probably repair after the damage caused by Cromwell's troops. But also in the kitchen, which is part of the L, there's sort of windows, which were clearly outdoor windows when they were originally built, but are now in looking into the kitchen. And, and so the whole building really deserves much more attention. Now, the, the lovely thing is there are one or two members of staff who've got um, metal detectors and found some interesting things, but we just feel that if we could make it get some keen old, old boys who, who remember sneaking in there for an illegal cigarette or something, who've now made a lot of money and want to put it towards a Cons conserving this, it could become a feature instead of being a fenced off ruin uh, and would then allow closer study in safety. Uh, and that would be lovely. Now, that's the story in a way that Scottish Castles Association is all about, is how we can make the most of the history of our heritage. And on that call, I just would finish. I've gone on for more than long enough. Uh, but anyway, Thank you very much. And uh, as I say, if any of you are interested in joining us on any of our tours or can uh, introduce me to members, people who've, who've got uh, castles or ruins in their garden, um, we'd be, I'd be delighted to find out more about them. But thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>